Hello everyone, my name is Takama and this is Karma Out of the Kitchen. Hi everyone and welcome to the second video of Karma Out of the Kitchen. These videos are a Q&A for you as well as a chance to discuss food related topics if we have time. And before I get to any questions, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So the first bit is a big thank you to everyone who has liked and followed along on the Karma's Kitchen Facebook page. And especially to those who have been interacting and sharing your experiences with food and how the recipes have worked out for you. Thank you so much. Um, I've really appreciated the response and it's also been very humbling and a little overwhelming, but it's all good. It's all wonderful. Um, I just, beyond what I anticipated. So I hope that Karma's Kitchen continues to grow in a very healthy, positive way for us all. And um, thank you too, to everyone on YouTube who has been watching, especially to those of you who have subscribed. I hope you'll continue to like the videos and the recipes that I have to share. And for all of you, I shall endeavor to continue to provide properly researched nutritional information, as well as as many recipes as I possibly can. Um, so that's that bit. Thank you all, thanks. The next thing I just wanted to bring up is that I know filming this, this video is going out late, and I apologize for that. I'm trying to make sure I have a video once a week um, unfortunately, I had a bit of a gardening emergency <laughs> that took longer than I anticipated, so it's, um, I'm a bit late. Um, where I am is planting season, and uh, for my chickens who love to dig, me digging and fresh seedlings to, to chew and nibble on is just way too much for them. So uh, I had to uh, fence off my herb garden and my vegetable garden before I had none left. Um, yeah, that happens. <laughs> um, and the other reason why this video is going out late is because I actually didn't, when I asked people for questions, I didn't actually expect anyone to respond. Um, so that's maybe an error on my part. So the original video I started doing, I had to scrap and um, do this video instead, which I'm sure is going to be tons better. I'd rather be answering your questions anyway. So that is why this video is going out late and um, I can't promise that this will never happen again um, but I'm certainly going to try and make sure that it happens as infrequently as possible. Okay that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Let's get to these questions and my very first question is can we see the chickens? And uh, yes, you can. Let's go have a look. So these are my chickens. On the left is Susie, in the middle is Debbie, and on the right is Ronnie. Susie and Debbie are Isa Browns. They're a chicken that is well known for its egg laying. And I get 14 eggs between them a week. So yeah, it's a lot of eggs. Um, their peak laying is up to 18 months. Susie and Debbie are a bit over two years old now so they're starting to come out of their peak laying and um, they live about five to seven years and they're great with kids. They're very curious. They love to dig. Um, they love their food <laughs> and they're just really wonderful friendly curious birds i always have fun with them and they always give me a good laugh now ronnie here is a barred plymouth rock hen they're moderate layers so in ronnie's peak about five eggs a week um ronnie's well out of her peak she's a bit over three years old but they are beautiful, beautiful hens. Oh, they don't like that alarm call. <laughs> the magpies are at war. 
Um, yeah, where was I? <laughs> I'm getting distracted by them, getting distracted by the magpie. Um, yeah, they're lovely. The Plymouth Rocks are lovely, lovely hens. Again, they're really great with children because they're just so calm and so docile. Um, they're curious too, but not quite as curious as eyes of browns. And um, I don't really have a bad thing to say about barred Plymouth Rocks, to be honest. I have just found them to be the most lovely, sweet hens to have. Um, I guess if you want lots of eggs, that's a downside. But um, for me, eggs are eggs are very appreciated. But uh, my girls are pets. So what else can I say about my chickens? Um, they can get destructive because they love to dig. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I had to cordon off my herb garden and veggie garden from imminent destruction. Um, they're just doing what chickens do. It's really important that they have a space that they can scratch and, and dig around in. And I do have a part of the garden that is virtually a desert because that's where they make their little uh, holes where they have their sand baths and where they, uh, well, just chill out and dig. Um, so I guess if you're keeping eyes of browns, you do need to have some idea of uh, where you want them to range. So that you know what to cordon off to protect and their curiosity can get them in trouble i haven't had it happen with these two because i've learnt from my last isa brown very first isa brown i had called betty and she went down the side of the house jumped up on the windowsill of my bedroom onto the top railing of the fence and then over into the neighbor's yard <sighs> It was not a fun morning <laughs> trying to get her back into our garden but um, I learned don't keep anything near fences that they can jump over because they will jump on them and they will jump over they're that curious so um, consequently the side of the house has been blocked off from curious chickens um, yeah I think that's really all I can think of to say about my girls. They're great for the garden. These three chickens are the first three chickens I've had that don't eat snails. I don't know why, they just don't. They turn their beak up at them. They do though eat everything else and they love spiders. Susie especially loves spiders. So they're really great for keeping down all the bugs and creepy crawlies around the yard. Um. What else can I say? Um, oh, well, obviously their poo is great. Compost. I have a very large compost heap in my garden, um, which their poo gets mixed into. So it's really, really great, especially for the veggie garden. So they're pets, really, that just give and give. They clean out the garden of bugs. They give you back compost. If you're lucky, you get eggs as well, and they don't really ask for much. They're very low maintenance. They're very easy to keep. They're very easy to um, clean up after. Um, yeah, so those are my chickens. Well, that was my chickens. I hope you enjoyed having a look at them. So now to the next question. And the next question is from Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Um, could I show some natural tips of, on pest control for herbs and vegetables? And yes, I can. I would love to show you what I do in my own garden. Um, to do that, we're going to need to go to the herb garden. So let's go. So this is my herb garden. I apologize if things get wobbly. I'll try and stay as steady as I can. I just wanted to take you here because not everyone can readily identify plants 
so um, I just want to show everyone what the plants actually look like that way if you want to purchase them you know what you're looking for or for some people you might even find that you already have these plants in your garden and you didn't know it okay well the first herb I'm going to show you is rosemary now rosemary is especially irritating for snails slugs and cabbage moss and part of that is because rosemary has a very high oil content that's what is giving you that really strong aroma and um, yeah snails and slugs they do not like it so it's one of those herbs that if you can chop it up into the soil and put it around your seedlings it's particularly irritating so that is rosemary the next herb is sage and you might remember from the first karma out of the kitchen i did i mentioned that my sage would be flowering in a couple of weeks and it has been a couple of weeks <laughs> and there we are all in full bloom and sage too is very annoying to snails, slugs and cabbage moths. They don't like it. If you've smelt fresh sage before, you'll know it's a very pungent, earthy smell. Um, it's not really something that makes you go, mm, I'll eat, eat a lot of that. Um, although on a side note, the flowers are edible. Um, they make a very pretty addition to salads and soups and uh, some people even deep fry them which I've never tried but um, maybe you want to give that a go if so if you're looking to do something completely new and different you can try sage flowers they are very tasty they taste uh, like a very mild version of the fresh leaves um, but very nice very yummy the leaves too are very yummy when they're fried. Sage chips, oh, they are beautiful. Anyway, enough of what you can eat. <laughs> These are the leaves, which are indeed edible. Um, but snails, slugs and cabbage moths, they're not so fond of them. Uh, they will avoid them. So this is one of the bushes and the rosemary, the same too. If you have the space in your garden where you can grow these and create like a hedge around your vegetable garden or plant in between other plants it will help deter all those bugs and slugs that want to nibble your your uh, seedlings okay the next herb is mint it's all the way down here I do have more but it's growing underneath the sage. This is the only little bit I've got out in the open. So this is cooking mint, or some people might know it as Moroccan mint. It has a very high menthol content and um, they use it for peppermint tea. It's also used in things like your mint slices or to give um, uh, the mint flavoring to chocolate. And uh, like the rosemary, it's highly irritating to snails, slugs particularly. Not so much to cabbage moth, but snails and slugs, they really don't like it. I'm going to assume it is because of the menthol content. Um, so if you can chop this herb up and mix it into the soil around your seedlings, it will act as a deterrent for snails and slugs. Okay, to the next herb, which is just around the corner this is thyme which is also in flower at the moment it's that time of season and thyme also has a high oil content similar to rosemary and uh, also has a very earthy smell I have to say thyme is one of the nicest smells that I've ever smelt um, in folk tradition it used to be used as a curative for depression and I can understand why because you get a, a bunch of fresh thyme and really smell it it's just so uplifting 
Um, it's not uplifting to snails, slugs and cabbage moth though. They're, they're not so fond of it. And this is another herb that you can train into a hedge. So if you have the space in your garden to, to do that and grow a hedge around your vegetable patch or grow some bushes in between other plantings, this will help deter snail, slugs and cabbage moth. And that is the range of herbs that will uh, repel an um, animals, <laughs> snails and slugs. Um, so I'm going to head back to the veranda now and I'm going to show you different ways of using all of these herbs, particularly if you uh, don't have the space to uh, do a hedging or extra plantings. So I'll see you in the veranda. So I'm here now in my veranda with a variety of herbs in addition to the ones that I showed you um, and plants as well that you can also use to help repel pests in your garden. What I showed you is by no means exhaustive of what you can use, that's just what I grow and what I use. With a bit of additional research I'm sure you'll be able to find plenty more plants and herbs that also act as repellents and that might be better suited to your garden or to your needs. So with that I do have one additional plant. I grow this in my front garden and you'll all be very familiar with it and that is lavender. And you might know from your mother, your grandmother, they would have made little posies that they hung in wardrobes and in drawers to help repel moths. And it works the same in your garden. Moths really don't like lavender at all. Lavender has a very high oil content. That's where its fragrance comes from, is from the oils. I'm not 100% sure why it's aggravating to moths. I don't know if the, the oils coming off the plant itself aggravate the moth. All I know is they don't like it. So if you can grow it, uh, it's a really great way to keep away moths. If you can't grow it or can't grow it near where you grow things, like I'm not able to, I can only grow lavender in my front garden, you can chop off the lavender heads and you scatter them very liberally, almost like a carpet, between the rows of plantings. So if you have silver beet, cabbage, lettuce, you would plant it in between. And that will help uh, repel particularly cabbage moss away from your cabbages. The other plant you can use, which, well, you're using the bean, is coffee grounds. So you're going to have to drink a lot of coffee. And like the lavender, you want to scatter it very liberally around your plants. And it really is just an irritant to, sa to snails and slugs. They don't like sliding over it, so they'll avoid it. So if you can create a barrier of coffee grounds around your seedling, they won't attack your seedlings. And that brings me to eggs. I haven't broken any eggs today, so <laughs> only the whole egg to show you. Don't use a whole egg. Um, but once you're finished with your eggs, crush up all the shells and you do the same thing. You create a barrier around the plant and the sharp edges and for the snails and slugs, the yuckiness of the shell, they will avoid the plant. So that can also be a deterrent. The problem with coffee grounds and eggshells are A, you need to drink a lot of coffee or you need to have a lot of friends who are happy to give you their coffee grounds and you need to use a lot of eggs or have people who are prepared to give you their broken eggshells because every time it rains and every time it's windy you're going to have to go out and redo it. As soon as there is a break in that barrier that you've built, they'll just go straight through it. Um, Coffee grounds and eggshells are only deterrents in as much as they're physical deterrents. So if there's no coffee ground there to annoy them, if there's no eggshell to annoy them, they'll just slide right on in and eat your cabbage. So they're things that are very high maintenance and maybe not for everyone. <clears throat>
Now the other herb that you can use is garlic. And you can use it in three ways. You can crush these up, so bruise them, and then you scatter them around your seedling. Garlic is seriously aggravating to snails and slugs, so it's highly effective for keeping them away. The other thing you can do if you don't want to have garlic cloves, because I guess they like the eggs and the coffee grounds, you're going to need lots of garlic cloves to be able to do it effectively. If that's not really something that you want to do, you can also use garlic oil and you make a barrier with oil and that will also keep the snails and slugs away because as I said, garlic is extremely irritating to snails and slugs. The third thing you can do is chop them up nice and fine and put them into a spray bottle and you can very lightly spray your plants with the garlic water and that will not only keep snails and slugs away but it will keep moths away. So that's sometimes a good idea to use for things which are very leafy. You just have to be very careful because if you overdo the garlic on the leaves itself, you can seriously harm or kill your plant. So make sure you don't make it too strong. I normally put three large cloves in the water to spray on the plants and that works and can work too for keeping some bugs away as well. Um, your um, little weevils, I found it to be effective in deterring. Um, so garlic's a really, a really, really great one if you can do that. Now with the herbs I showed you, a lot of them you can hedge and I spoke about the fact that if you can create a hedge. Now not everyone has the space for that. I certainly don't have the space for that. I need the space to grow vegetables. So um, what you can do is with the rosemary, just a reminder, because they're not effective when they're dry. They're only effective while they're fresh. So this is a little bit high maintenance, but uh, um, not as much as the coffee grounds or the eggshells. While they're still fresh, chop them up into pieces and you mix them in lightly with the soil. Don't, not too much that you bury it. Uh, the same as the mint. The mint. You just want to lightly mix it in. You still want to be, be able to see some of the leaves poking up from the surface. Or you can just use these sprigs as they are. And like the, the lavender heads, just apply them very liberally between the rows of plants. Thyme gets very stringy. Sort of like spaghetti. So you can cut off a big clump, and I did that just the other day. I chopped off a big clump from my thyme bush, and you just sprinkle that around the rose as it is. Um, and the sage leaves are probably best. I've never tried it with the full leaves themselves. Um, I've always chopped it up. So finally chop it up and mix it in with the soil. Or if you've got a lot of sage leaves, you can actually make like a little, a little barricade of chopped sage. It all depends on how many plants you have and how many plants you're needing to protect. If you've got a really big garden, I would seriously look into doing the garlic water and that's just for time 
and practicality. Again, every time it rains, you're still going to need to reapply the spray, but um, it's a lot quicker to do and it's a lot quicker to get together and, and prep. Um, but that said, I do find using the lavender heads and the rosemary spears, it, it's not it's not overly time consuming. The biggest part of the biggest part that is time consuming is actually cutting up enough of the herb to use. So that is all my knowledge on pest repellent. I hope that it's given you some ideas and some things to try and I hope they work for you. And if they do, please let, let me know how it turned out for you. Um, and if there's anything else that you would like to know about garden care of herbs and vegetables, let me know in the comments or message me through the Karma Kitchen Facebook page and um, I will do my best to answer. I think, I think we've got one more question. And that question is, how can I cook good food without it being so time consuming? Let me reorganize my space and I'll show you how. So I am back with my table full of goodies. Just to reiterate, the question was about being, um, well, struggling, finding it difficult, um, cooking good food because it's so time consuming. And this is something that I empathize with. I have an allergy to soybeans and I'm also very lactose intolerant. So I have to cook two separate meals. Otherwise, Jamie misses out on food that he likes and I am not eating food that's going to make me sick. So um, yeah, it's a situation that a lot of people are in. A lot of people end up with um, having medical conditions or health problems where they have to change their diet, either temporarily or permanently. And you just can't go and buy what you need off the supermarket shelf. So you find yourself having to cook. And it is time consuming and it is sometimes very exhausting, especially when you have to pick through ingredients to work out what you can have and what you can't have. That's hard enough in itself. The answer to reducing the cooking time is batch cooking. And I don't know if that is a term that you have heard of, but I'm going to operate from the point of zero knowledge, um, just for the benefit of, of ev anyone who may watch this. Um, so batch cooking is where you cook up a whole lot of something or a lot of things that will last you either a week, two weeks, a month, um, if you've got the freezer capacity, three months, hey, why not? Um, and um, it in itself is time consuming and can seem very stressful and overwhelming. But when you break it down into the steps, it will save you time and it will save you money. And it is definitely a better way to eat healthier. And it is a way to make sure that the food that you eat is custom to you and what you need. Um, so what do we do? The very first thing is to go, okay, I'm going to give the batch cooking a go. And the second thing is to find a day in your week that will be your cooking day. It's best to get it all done at once. Um, sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, so whether it's a Sunday or a Wednesday, um, as long as the day works for you, that's what matters. It depends on how much you're going to cook. And I would suggest at first, while you are getting to grips with how batch cooking works, that you, you don't cook more than a week's meals. Um, otherwise, you could find it too overwhelming and, and you, don't, you don't want to feel defeated before you've really given it a chance. So start planning with a week's meals and once you're really in the groove with that, well, then you can expand the amount of time. And obviously how much you can cook is going to depend upon your freezer space. So if you're somebody who only has a very small fr freezer, um, I would never suggest updating your fridge or getting another freezer, but you might have to... Um, 
break it down into smaller steps again. So maybe only cook for four days at a time rather than the whole week or two weeks. Um, yeah, so that's the next thing you need to do is once you have made the decision to batch cook and you've got the day to batch cook, you need to work out your capacity. How much can you fit in? Can you only fit in a few days of cooking? And you know, that's okay because even getting a three day break from cooking is still better than no break at all. Um, I know I personally do not like the thought of cooking every day of the week. So just two, three nights off can do a lot to help reduce your stress and feel a little less overwhelmed by cooking and and feel a little less consumed by food because that can often happen too where you start to feel like all you ever do is think about think about food and what to eat and and that can become stressful as well so um once you've worked out your capacity you then need to look at storage and i think storage is far more important than cooking implements and pots and pans because you can split a soup between two saucepans, but if you don't have the right containers, then you're going to end up ruining the food that you've worked so hard to cook. So the containers that I have, these are, I suppose, the, the, uh, the premier containers. These are glass containers, and these will always be the more expensive of what you buy. One, because it's glass. But two is the lids. These have very, very thick, good seals on them. And the ones that I have also have a vent as well. This helps with pressing air out so that you get as much of the air out before you seal it. But also to these can go straight from the freezer to the microwave. So you just lift the vent in the microwave for the steam to escape so they they can be pretty expensive i have small medium and large and the large ones are thirty dollars each um i only have two of them <laughs> because they are thirty dollars each um the little one this little one which is about 500 mil capacity, that's $10. Of course, it also depends on, on where you purchase it from. But if you want to do long-term freezing, so if you're wanting to freeze things for two plus weeks, you really need these containers because otherwise there's too much risk of freezer burn getting in and spoiling your food. Um, and especially if you want to freeze things like rice, these are invaluable. Uh, I find other containers, it just ruins the rice. So having some of those for some long-term freezing, really, really important. These containers are good for short-term freezing. They have a seal as well, but it's not nearly as good a seal. Um, Air does get in, air does get out, and contrary to what they say, um, they can and do leak. <laughs> um, so they work all right though, for short-term storage, for one to two weeks, it's fine. And of course, they're really great for the fridge. These are excellent. A lot of people end up getting, um, there you are. And they come with little blue lids. These are really great. Don't be tempted to use takeaway containers. They do not have the seal for fridge or freezer. They really are only for temporary food carrying for takeaway from shop to home. They're really not made for storage. Um, and I really don't recommend using them as storage, even in the pantry. I originally did because it was the cheapest thing and I didn't have really any money. Um, 
but what I found is even with the pantry if you have things in there long term they very quickly go stale because they just don't have any seals on them these don't have any seals either they seal about as securely as a takeaway container but they are really great for lunches ahead of time so if you want to make five days worth of lunches that can go in the fridge fantastic they're good to use my last storage container is this big beauty and this is excellent for salads which is what that insert is for a lot of garden salads will keep three to four days in the fridge no issues and having a container like this is wonderful because the salad sits on the shelf and that stops the moisture from coming in and spoiling any lettuce or cucumber and keeps it fresher for longer and um, all you do is make sure that you you keep your salad dressing to the side don't put your you make your salad and you put it into here and in another container you put the dressing so you just drizzle the dressing on every night that's that that's the big burden that you have um, and and it will so definitely four days um, depending on the salad um, if it's if it doesn't have as much water it depends on the water content if you don't have a, a salad that has a high water content you could probably keep it in five to six days in one of these containers with very very little degradation to the salad or to the taste of it um, so they are definitely a really good thing to invest in I paid well actually I didn't pay $15 I waited till it was on special and got it half price but <laughs> but I believe it was a it was roughly around about $15 roughly um, the other thing well things you'll need small medium and large is Ziploc bags these are really great for prep if you just have like a prep day where all you do is pre-chop vegetables and put them into here and you can put them into combinations as well so if you intend to do stir fries in the month you can make one bag that is full of broccoli and baby corn and, and red capsicum um, and put that into one bag and then you can make up another stir fry a lot and another so in that month um, you feel like stir fry you can just pull out the vegetables they're all ready to go um, geez I really am thinking on the spot I apologize for all my umming and eyeing the other thing with frozen vegetables as well is depending on what you're going to use it for so if you're going to use them in things like stir fries and soups and stews you can just go from straight um, wash your vegetables then wait until they're completely dry make sure they're fully dry and then put them into the freezer bag and freeze them if you're wanting to use vegetables for other things or vegetables in salads it might help to blanch them first and give them a bit of a pre-cook that will that will believe it or not help preserve some of the flavor of the vegetables and again you blanch them make sure they're completely dry before you put them into the freezer you can also freeze things like bread uh, shop-bought bread will last about three months in the free freezer and you get some baking paper and you roll the slice in the baking paper and then you wrap that into foil and then you put it into the freezer bag and it will come out just like the day it was bought perfectly fine I've done that uh, well I do do that quite a bit because Jamie and I don't eat a huge amount of bread so it's very rare that we'd actually get through 
a loaf so normally I freeze what's left over um, and the baking paper and the foil just help protect the bread bread is very very prone to freezer burn uh, homemade bread will freeze roughly around about six months it lasts a little bit longer there's a lot to be said for less preservatives and additives <laughs> um, yeah so that's that's that tip you'll need labels it's extremely important to have labels and you want the date you put it in and you want your approximate expiration date I in general give everything about three months and that's also because I know myself and Jamie well enough to know that if we haven't eaten it in three months we're probably not going to um, but depending on what you freeze um, chicken will freeze up to a year so if you buy a barbecue chicken and you strip the carcass and get it all all the meat for sandwiches and get it packaged up into freezer bags um, little freezer bags that will freeze for up to 12 months so that is the other thing that you need is a freezer guide um, I might put one up on the Facebook page for everyone to uh, to take for their um, own use. Uh, freezer guide is very very handy and it helps you work out approximately how long what you've made is going to last. The other things that you need for batch cooking are a pair of scales and that's for weighing and measuring and depending on your dietary needs that might be important um, and when it comes out to portioning too a lot of times it helps if you can weigh out each portion so that uh, you get the even amount of portions and you don't get three huge servings and then the last two are these really tiny servings um, so you also need measuring cups and measuring spoons and the usual things that you need if you want to cook big batches of things then a big stock pot is probably the way to go so that you can do that um, so that's a lot of stuff to take into consideration but once you've got all that and you know that you've got enough storage containers you've got enough ziplock bags um, you've got enough freezer space and fridge space to cook at least a week's worth of meals or at the very minimum four days worth of meals then you can plan your recipe or your recipes I normally cook three to four depending on how many serves I'm going to get out of a, a, a recipe um, you may cook more more you may cook less uh, that's a completely personal preference then work out your ingredients ideally you want an overlap so you want some ingredients to be the same in each recipe um, and uh, yeah think ahead <laughs> what you're going what you think you're going to want to eat or what you think you're going to be in the mood for and whether you're also going to do things like lunches like I do lunches and dinners um, you may want to do the same you may just want to do dinners everybody's different um, but yeah work out what you're going to do work out what your recipes are and like I said try and get them to overlap with some ingredients um, and look at what you've got in your cupboards and what you can use in in your cupboards um, batch cooking can be a great way of avoiding food waste and making sure that you use up everything and if you can get enough ingredients to overlap you can then do things like buying in bulk which ultimately is cheaper um, yeah that's the big thing there I'm just trying to think if there's anything else no and then there's your day to cook you, you we're coming full circle um, once you've got your recipes planned you've got all your ingredients then you're ready then you're ready to cook
and be prepared to cook anywhere from one to six hours depending on how many uh, recipes that you're going to do try and clean up as you go it saves up cleaning at the end of it um, and uh, make sure very importantly before you put anything away into the fridge or freezer make sure that everything has cooled completely don't be tempted to put things in while they're still a little bit warm um, they just they don't quite freeze as well and particularly in the fridge you can get a buildup of bacteria which uh, is definitely not something that you're wanting um, freezing doesn't destroy bacteria all it does is send it into stasis so if you provide a breeding ground for unhealthy bacteria by having something lukewarm in the fridge um, or in the freezer um, yeah you you can run the risk of food spoiling and you can run the risk of food poisoning when you then go to reheat so um, that's that's a very important one make sure everything has cooled down completely before you put it in the fridge or freezer and that is pretty much the basic essence of batch cooking I can write more about it if anyone is interested um, so do let me know where everyone's interest level is on it as I said it is overwhelming to start up it is overwhelming to get going but once you're into the flow of it and you found your flow with the food that you cook it is one of the most efficient ways to cook I spend one day where I uh, cook myself to exhaustion <laughs> sometimes um, not all the time but sometimes it, I, I do um, and but I do all that cooking and then for the next two weeks all I have to do is heat and serve or maybe drizzle dressing on a salad and just the, the stress relief of that is is amazing and it does free up time because that time every night you would have been cooking you're now not cooking you can now do something else you can now plan something else or you can just take the time to to relax a bit so it does pay off in in the long term um, and fairly immediately too that very first effort you make where you go oh my gosh what have I got myself into and you're there all day cooking it'll still reap its reward because you'll get to the end of that and now you won't have to cook for the next three days the next week the next two weeks however long you you cooked food for so it, it's it is a fairly immediate return in the amount of time it gives back to you for that initial investment of time and I think that's all I can say on <laughs> batch cooking at this point. Um, I hope that wasn't too confusing. And like I said, if there is more interest, let me know. And I can put it in a format that's maybe um, uh, a little less haphazard. <laughs> um, but I hope that's helped and given you some ideas and given you some pause for thought in how maybe you, you could go about cooking in the future. Well, that brings me to the end of this video of Karma Out of the Kitchen. I hope some of you have found the information informative and I hope some of you have found it interesting and helpful. I did have some more questions, but uh, I'll pick them up in the next Karma Out of the Kitchen. And that's my question to all of you. My original intention for these Q&As was to be once a month, but should they be more regular? Or are we all happy with once a month? That's my question to all of you. And with that, I hope I do see some of you on the Karma's Kitchen Facebook. And I hope I see some of you here in the comments section. Please leave any questions that you may have. They are always welcome. And I will always do my best to answer them uh, as best as I can. Um... If you liked this video, please like, 
hit the like button. And if you would like to follow along with videos that I'm doing in the future, don't forget to hit subscribe so that you can stay up to date with what I'm doing. Thank you all for your time and thank you all for your wonderful questions. I've had a lot of fun trying to put together all the answers for you all. And coming up, the next video will be a Sapporo Ramen. It's going to be a cooking challenge in four parts. <laughs> so for accomplished cooks who dare, that will be coming up. Until then, may you all have good karma in your kitchen. Bye for now.